Hi, my name is Jeppe, and I will talk to you about how we were able to predict uh, hearing aid preference in individuals using their listening experiences uh, from daily life. And my co-authors are listed up there on the left. The general problem is that a benefit of something might not mean a preference for something. So you might not pick the broccoli or an ice cream, even though it's more beneficial for you. This is the same with uh, uh, audiology, that a new beamformer that improves speech and audibility with 20%, would you pick such a device over something that gives you a nice bass? So the research aim is really to understand how preferences for hearing aid features are formed, and also if we can predict them from listening experiences alone. In our particular study, we are looking at a choice between premium hearing aids that are differing mainly in their noise reduction implementation. In order to collect listening experiences, we conducted a randomized crossover ecological momentary assessment trial and we had 40 people recruited from normal clinical flow, and they were divided into two groups that would use either hearing aid one or hearing aid two first, and then swap over. After the two wear periods, they were then asked which hearing aid did they want, and they were also able to keep it and take the, take the hearing aid with them home. Uh, each wear period was uh, two weeks in duration, and during that they would perform EMAs several times a day, and we would also record the sound data, so the signal to noise ratio and the sound pressure level associated with each EMA. Each wear period would also end with participants filling out the full speech, spatial and qualities of hearing scale, which is a 49 item questionnaire uh, about listening uh, outcomes in daily life. At the end of the day, we could then stratify ratings by whether they be belong to the preferred or the non-preferred hearing aid. So this is our labels, so to say. And the two hearing aids we used was the Ochicon Open S1 and the Ochicon More. Uh, prediction models comes in uh, two flavors, uh, diagnostic and prognostic. And uh, the diagnostic prediction is really about whether we can generalize learned preferences from a group of people to a new user so that this new user could be assigned a technology based solely on listening experiences. Um, this would require a leave one out cross validation approach where EMAs or ratings uh, from all the participants except one uh, are used to train a model and then we can test on the ratings from that last person. There's also prognostic prediction and this is really more about individuals, whether we can predict a preference within an individual and how it changes over time. And to do that, we uh, need to do five-fold cross-validation with equal proportions among participants because participants give different amounts of ratings. Uh, the speed, spatial, and quality of hearing scale uh, overall results you can see here. The um, mean SSQ rating seems to be in general higher for the preferred than the non-preferred uh, in most individuals at least. If you look at all the items and look at which ones were significant, there was only six of the 49 items that were significant. And the strongest one was uh, from the spatial scale. Uh, do sounds of people or things you hear but cannot see at first turn out to be closer than expected when you see them? The second strongest predictor, and this was actually two questions from the quality scale, both related to listening effort. Um, in terms of the EMA, we can see the EMA data here. The questions that was posed, the six questions on the left, then the self-reported listening activity, and then the sound environment the uh, EMAs were completed in. And what you see on the x-axis is then the estimated rating difference, meaning that if it's more positive, it's more sensitive towards preference. In general, we can see that the EMAs with the highest sensitivity are the ones performed in noisier, meaning low to medium SNR environments, while listening to music, television, or people talking. Uh, we can also see that it's the question around sound satisfaction that has the highest sensitivity. So in general, there's factors in our data that uh, would suggest that we can actually predict preference. Here, we applied random forest classification models with all the features available to then predict if each individual EMA rating belonged to the preferred or the not preferred hearing aid. Um, what you can see here is the prediction accuracy uh, with the EMA alone. So this is only looking at the rating from 0 to 10 of the sound satisfaction. And on the y-axis, you can then see the prediction accuracy if we also add a contextual feature. So in this case, it's the self-reported listening activity. And you can see that actually increases prediction accuracy for all the participants. We can do the same, but adding uh, 
the sound data instead. You can see the yellow uh, dots now, and we get more or less the same benefit from having this sound data uh, into the model. If we add both features, we can see that we have the highest prediction accuracy around 93% uh, correct. We can also look behind the model and see what actually caused this prediction accuracy, and we can look at the feature importance. So this would tell us how much the prediction accuracy would suffer if we removed a feature from the model. Uh, maybe not so uh, surprising, participant is uh, of high importance, meaning that preferences are really individual and also the way they're formed are really individual. But it's also uh, interesting to see how the importance of the EMA rating itself goes down when we have added these contextual data, meaning that it becomes less important what the rating actually was between 0 and 10, but more important to also know in what environment and in what context the rating was performed. So with that, we can conclude that SSQ and EMA equally well can predict a diagnostic preference. I didn't show the results in this presentation, but the results are really that each method performs a 72% on average prediction accuracy, but they are not completely overlapping, meaning that we can further increase the prediction accuracy if we combine them, and we can then correctly predict 93% of all the participants. If we look at the prognostic prediction, looking at the EMA ratings themselves, we can then see that we have a high predict, uh, prediction accuracy if we also add the contextual data. So we reach this 93% uh, again. From the more descriptive result, we saw that preferences are driven by the benefits for spatial hearing and listening effort. That was the SSQ results. But also it was driven by listening experiences evaluated during television, music, and people talking, listening situations. Um, and especially also if they were in low to medium SNRs. Of course, these results are contingent on the fact that we used hearing aids that differed in the noise reduction technologies. So you might think that maybe some of these uh, you know, contexts for high sensitivity would be different if the hearing aids had differed on other uh, parameters. Lastly, we also saw that the boost in prediction accuracy using the contextual data was really for the individuals with the lower prediction accuracy on the EMAs alone. And this would uh, suggest that for some, it's equally important to consider the context in which they perform EMAs as well as the rating itself. So the perspective is really that EMAs, or these in situ self-reported listening experiences, are ideal for individualized hearing outcome investigations. I will end with this, uh, saying that all the details and more are currently uh, just published in the ear and hearing paper you can see here. And thank you for your attention.